But February made me shiver With every paper I deliver Bad news on the doorstep I couldn't take one more step I can't remember if I cried When I read about his widowed bride But something touched me deep inside The day the music died On February 2nd, 1959, Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, and J.P. Richardson, known as the Big Bopper, took the stage of the Surf Ballroom in Clear Lake, Iowa, and played before a packed house of ecstatic teenagers. It was the biggest night the small town had ever experienced. For the three stars, it would be the last night of their lives. Walking into the Surf Ballroom is like walking into a time machine. As you walk across an empty ballroom and you hear your footsteps just echo off the walls, you want to imagine Buddy Holly up there performing, Richie Valens up there performing, the big bopper, his ho ho ho's in a long jacket. And you try to imagine that, you really do. It's, it's, it's a time machine. I'm not going to get spiritual and say I have felt their presence and heard their songs and echoes in there, but I have stood on that stage and said, why did it happen that they had to die? Rock and roll exploded onto the music scene in 1954 with Bill Haley and the Comets and Elvis Presley. Rock and roll is cool, Daddy, and you know it. Their fusion of white country swing and black rhythm and blues ignited teen spirit. Elvis was a white dude singing black music, black style. And when he was on the Ed Sullivan Show, Buddy Holly saw him. He said, I can't believe somebody could do that on network television. And that just changed Buddy. You knew when you looked at him, he knew what he wanted. He wanted to be a singing star. Buddy Holly's rapid rise to stardom began on September 7th, 1936 with his birth in Lubbock, Texas. Young Buddy lived for music and by the mid 1950s, he was a teenage rock and roll prodigy anxious to make his mark. He became very impatient when he seen other fellows about his age breaking into music like Elvis Presley and the Everly Brothers. He knew he was just as good or better than they were. Buddy formed a band with his friends Jerry Allison, Nicky Sullivan, and Joe B. Malden. They called themselves the Crickets. It was 1957, and before the year was out, Buddy Holly would be a star. Well, you give me all your loving and you get to her loving. I all your hug. Buddy went to see The Searchers, a John Ford movie. John Wayne said every 30 minutes, every 15 minutes, 20 minutes, he would say, That'll be the day, Pilgrim. Holly wrote the song. Well, that'll be the day when you say goodbye. Yeah, that'll be the day when you make me cry. By September 57, That'll Be the Day was the number three song in the nation. Within months, Buddy scored another big hit with a song named for drummer Jerry Allison's girlfriend. <laughs> put Peggy Sue's name on there because at that time uh, I wasn't speaking to Jerry <laughs> so I think Buddy Buddy was kind of playing a little bit of uh, Cupid the song worked Jerry and Peggy Sue got married and in just four months Peggy Sue made the top ten selling over a million copies they get right from the starters if it's sort of a Long. Well, uh, we've had a few rough times, I guess you say, but we've been real lucky getting it this quick. Uh, well, Texas, nice to, uh, nice to have you up here. Thank Let's you. have a very nice hand for these Texas folks. With two hits climbing the charts, Buddy and his band played their first national tour with some of rock and roll's biggest names, Chuck Berry, Fats Domino, and Eddie Cochran. It was a grueling tour, and when it was over, Nicky Sullivan quit the crickets. That tour took more out of me than anything I had ever done in my life. Think about your own self for a moment that you had to work 21 hours a day and that had gone on for about five months. Something has to give and I gave. Buddy and the Crickets continued as a trio and by January of 58, they had their third top 10 hit in less than a year. 
Oh, boy. What you got coming up in the future for records? Well, we've got one that was just released the other day by the Crickets called Oh, Boy. That'll mean that you've got three songs in our chat that come up. <laughs> How do you think it compares with the others? Well, I like Oh, Boy uh, better than that of the day, but... Uh, of course, I'm no judge. <laughs> Less than a year after they began, Buddy and his band were now huge stars, and their fame spread to England and Australia. But as quickly as success had come, it wasn't fast enough for 21-year-old Buddy Holly. He acted like he didn't have enough time to do what he wanted to do. I don't know whether he thought maybe his life would be cut short or his career would be cut short, or he was just in a hurry to to do something and get it over. He grew up in a hurry. Just you know why. Buddy fell in love in the summer of 58. While visiting New York, he met a young woman working at a record company. As usual, Buddy moved fast. And within two months, he and Maria Elena Santiago were married. I know to love why. He proposed to her the, on their first date. And she asked him, or told him rather, or in her words, that you haven't known me long enough. And he says, well, I haven't got time. That sounds like Buddy. I haven't got time. Holly moved to New York to be with his new bride and near the heart of the music business. But Cricket's Jerry Allison and Joe B. Malden stayed in Texas. As the group started to split up, Buddy withdrew a little bit because he, he was hurt that we would walk away from all of this, this fame and fortune. Oh. By December 1958, Buddy Holly was an anxious young man, without a band and without a hit record. Buddy had recorded some new songs, which had come out and disappointed him as far as charts. He got up to the 50s and he got up to the 40s, who was not having number ones and number twos again. Not only had his career hit a lull, but 22-year-old Buddy needed money. He had a lot of holdings, he had a lot of publishing money due him and things like that, but he didn't have cash in his pocket. His one option was to earn cash and boost his record sales by going back on tour. And the only tour at that time that he could have gone on was this winter dance party tour. He was forced to go on a tour he didn't really want to go on in a time of the year when he didn't want to do it in order to make money to pay the bills for uh, his wife and uh, a child that was going to come along. I know that... But he didn't want to go. Buddy Holly's string of top 10 hits ended in 1958. That same year, as Buddy's star was losing its luster, two new rock and roll luminaries blazed onto the charts Richie Valens and the Big Bopper. Hello, baby. Yeah, this is the Big Bopper speaking. The Big Bopper was the stage name of J.P. Richardson, a Beaumont, Texas disc jockey with a talent for funny ad libs and a knack for writing songs. He knew music. Not that he was an accomplished musician. He played the guitar, but he knew music. He had a feel for music. The Big Bopper was born Giles Perry Richardson on October 12, 1930. The eldest son of an oil field worker, J.P. grew up poor. His roots were quite humble. Um, his, um, he was, had a close family, but uh, certainly no economic good fortune in his life. J.P. struggled all his young life to get ahead. And by the age of 21, he was a married man determined to give his family all the things he never had. That's basically the reason he went into the music business. You know, if he could have probably made a couple of hundred bucks a week in radio, that would have probably done him at the time. But he couldn't. In 1958, 27-year-old Richardson was spinning records on the radio. I told the witch doctor I was in love with you. A big man with a big sense of humor, he noted the popularity of novelty tunes like The Witch Doctor and The Purple People Eater, songs that made no sense, but lots of money. What uh, he decided he was going to do was record a record which put these two characters together. And it was called The Purple People Eater Meets The Witch Doctor. On the flip side, the Big Bopper recorded Chantilly Lace. Chantilly Lace and a pretty face and a ponytail Hanging down, wiggle in the walk and a giggle in the talk Make the world go round, 
Well, it caught on. It just simply caught on. The purple people here meets the witch doctor was immediately forgotten. And the Chantilly Lace was the rage. Oh, baby, that's the one I like. By the fall of 1958, Chantilly Lace made the top ten and was one of the most played records in the country. Oh, baby, you know what I like. The song promised to give the bopper, his wife, and family the financial security they yearned for. But he needed to promote the record, and to do that, he had to take his music on the road. So in December of 58, the Big Bopper was booked on the Winter Dance Party Tour. He didn't like to be away from his family. That was the hardest thing in the world for him. At the airport, J.P. hugged his five-year-old daughter, Deborah and said goodbye to his wife, Titsi, who was six months pregnant with their second child. She didn't want him to go, but they knew that uh, they knew this was a, a special thing for him. I mean, you know, uh, with Buddy and Richie and Dion and the Belmonts, and, you know, these are people that mother had heard of and listened to, and, you know, it was quite an exciting thing for him. The Big Bopper then headed north to join the Winter Dance Party. Welcome on, let's go, let's go. For 17-year-old Richie Valens, the youngest star on the tour, the Winter Dance Party was the high point of a career that was just starting to take off. He was so excited about the stars that he was, was going to meet. And um, he was very, very excited about meeting Betty Holly. Well, I gotta get me she knows just what to do. You have to realize that his career was eight months long. You know, from the time he was discovered, he recorded the first album until February 3rd, 59. And uh, he packed a lot of living into eight months, you know. Richie Valens was born Richard Valenzuela on May 13th, 1941. The second of five children, his life in the San Fernando Valley of Los Angeles was difficult. He was only 10 years old when his father died, leaving the family in poverty. It was a rough childhood. I would say a very rough childhood because in the first place, he came from a very poor family. These are small little wooden houses on wood sills. And under the house, they scooped out. So people were sleeping out there. And that's where Richie was sleeping. His main goal in life was to make records so he could make money and buy his mom a new home. And that's all he talked about. Richie began playing the guitar as a young boy. And by the time he was in his teens, he was already winning fans. <laughs> He knew he was going to be a star. He just knew it. At school, when we had concerts, he just rocked the place. I mean, we were rocking and rolling. Ooh, my Richie's energetic style attracted the attention of record producer Bob Keane. There was this kind of bull-like guy standing up there, a young fella, and he was cranking away on a guitar with a little beat-up amp, and he was just really cooking. Keen signed Richie Valenzuela to a deal and promptly changed his name. Being Latin could have been a, a very big deterrent for him, but fortunately I got the idea to change his name so nobody knew what he was before he got out there and got his face in front of people. In the summer of 58, Richie released his first record, Come On, Let's Go. By autumn, it was on the national charts. Richie's biggest hit came next, a song dedicated to his best girl, Donna. Oh, Donna. Oh, Donna. He called me up on the telephone one night, and um, he said, I wrote a song for you. While Donna made teens swoon, its flip side, La Bamba, got them dancing. Richie Valens was a very important figure. Richie Valens was the first Chicano rock and roll star. I mean, he was truly a pioneer in, in, in that sense, and, and young. I mean, who knows what he would have gone on to do, uh, uh, given the cojones he had, but also the smarts that he had and the talent that he had. 
As Richie's popularity soared, his manager Bob Keen pushed to keep him before the public. He even landed Richie a feature role in the rock and roll movie, Go Johnny Go. In December of 58, just seven months after Richie was discovered, Keen booked him on his first big tour, the Winter Dance Party. Friends and family were proud to see him go. I had no fear that he would not return. I knew he would return. Hi, everybody. This is Richie Valens, and I hope to see you all real soon. Teenage rock and roll sensation Richie Valens was eager to join the Winter Dance Party tour in January 1959. Even though it was a Buddy Holly tour, he was really the number one uh, hot shot at that time because his record was really up there and getting an awful lot of airplay. Before Richie left for the Midwest, his mother held a goodbye party at the new house her hit-making son had bought for her. And my father wouldn't let me go. I didn't forgive him for that for a long, long time. You're mine. Richie's family drove him to the airport for his flight to the Midwest. And the last time we saw him was at the airport. So I would always run to the insurance to get insurance for him. And he says, I don't need that insurance, dear. I don't need that insurance. Yes, you do. You're going to take it. And that was the last time we seen him when he left to Iowa on that tour. I wish I had at least had an opportunity to have said goodbye. The Winter Dance Party, a three-week jaunt through the heart of the Midwest, the part of America that freezes solid in February. There was Richie Valens, The Big Bopper, Frankie Sardo, Dion and the Belmonts, and Buddy Holly, along with his three new sidemen, Waylon Jennings, Tommy Alsup, and Charlie Bunch. Maybe, baby, I'll have you. Buddy Holly had put together a new band for the 1959 Winter Dance Party Tour, including his friend, a Texas disc jockey named Waylon Jennings. He'd gone downtown and bought a bass, and he said, you got two weeks to learn how to play that thing. I had no earthly idea what did what on a bass, but I memorized where I put my fingers on which songs. Buddy also recruited drummer Carl Bunch and guitarist Tommy Also. The Winter Dance Party was ready to roll. The middle of winter it was cold, cold. I don't know who, I don't know whose idea it was, but it really was a bad idea. We were going down the road, and it was 40 below, uh, and the bus froze up. And there we sat in a snowstorm with a bus frozen. That's not our drummer's feet got frostbite on the on the bus. We got to where we hated that bus. We really did. But we were in showbiz. Three weeks of one night stands and all night bus rides. 21 days of being bounced around the insides of a bus like ping pong balls. The problem was whoever scheduled the tour. You started way over here and went 400 miles to your next venue and then went back 30 miles from the first one to do your third one, if you know what I'm trying to say. Hopscotching back and forth. As the bus zigzagged across the icy Midwest, tour promoters arranged to fill an open date in the schedule by booking a concert in Clear Lake, Iowa. The General Artist Corporation called Mr. Carol Anderson at the surf ball and said, we have an open date. It's a little bit out of our way, but we can make it. The guys can drive the bus down to Mason City. Would you be interested in the show? And uh, Carol said, Bob, I have a chance to bring in uh, Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, and the Big Booper. I said, book the show. Absolutely, just book it. And the ticket sales just took right off. On the 11th day of the tour, after playing 10 towns in the past 10 nights, a cold, tired, and disgusted Buddy Holly wanted to get himself and his two bandmates off the frigid tour bus. He decided that after the show in Clear Lake that night, they would fly ahead to the next gig. Well, we were on the bus, and he said, when we get to Clear Lake, he said, let's see if we can't charter a plane and uh, fly up to Fargo, North Dakota. He was actually doing it just, just kind of as a favor to us, you know where he could get in, get a little rest and everything. That evening, the winter dance party bus limped into Clear Lake, Iowa, and the stars staggered out. When they came in here, they were almost frostbitten. Big Bopper was running a fever. He was just perspiring profusely. Buddy Holly had a question for the surf ballroom's manager, Carol Anderson. They wanted to get in and get a head, and they asked me if there was a charter flight out of here. 
They were tired. They were hungry. We got them some food, some at the surf ball, and a couple of guys went across the street to the restaurant. And I remember Buddy getting off and asking, is there a laundromat around where we can get our clothes washed? And I guess it was the hour there wasn't one or it was closed or something, but I remember they could not get clothes washed there at that particular time. That was the reason that Buddy wanted to fly, you know, so he gets some laundry done. Because we'd been out 12 days and our shirts were starting to stand up on their own, you know. The winter dance party stars may have been worn out, but 1,500 local teenagers were ready to rock. Well, we arrive at the surf ballroom and the line was already there and the parents are lined up and people are waiting to get in and uh, to buy tickets and they just poured into the surf ballroom. The floor was about three-fourths full, solid with people up to the, and a few of them sat around in the uh, first row of booths around here. It was a big night. Nobody in that area, Northeast Iowa, had ever seen stars this big in their life. And for all of these youngsters, and for this young kid, disc jockey, it was the biggest thrill of my life. At 8 p.m., the curtains parted on the stage of the surf ballroom. Hello, baby. Yeah, this is the Big Bopper speaking. <laughs> the Big Bopper came out. And uh, he did his uh, telephone routine and uh, had everybody laughing. Will I what? Oh, baby, you know what I like. Chantilly lace and a pretty face and a ponytail hanging down. After him, we had uh, Richie Valens. The next song I'll do for you is named Dark. Oh, my God. The girls went crazy over Richie Valens. And he was about four seconds into his music, and it was this Richie had been there all his life. He was just shy, you know. But what was wild is he was wild on stage, you know. It was like two different people. He just warmed to the kids and had everybody singing and dancing, of course, to La Bamba. And I don't know how many times he, he had to sing that. It was a real up night. Everybody was rocking. Everybody having a good time. Yeah. I'm going to tell you how it's going to be. When Buddy first started, there was that just constant cheering and yelling and cheering and yelling. With all the kids screaming, you could just barely hear your amps. It was, it was kind of wild, you know. When he changed the mood, he'd go into a bit of a quiet tune. Everybody would hush and listen to it. Well, all right, so I'm being foolish. Well, all right, let people know about the dreams and wishes you wish in the night when lights are low. Well, the stars of the winter dance party burned up the stage until midnight. While they rocked, Carol Anderson called Dwyer Flying Service to charter a plane for Buddy and his band. The plane could take up to three passengers at $36 a piece. When the curtain came down, Buddy, Waylon, and Tommy also rushed to catch their flight to the next stop on the tour. Word got around amongst the performers that Holly and his two sidemen were going to fly out instead of busing it. The big buffer couldn't stand the thought of those 430 frozen miles between Clear Lake and Moorhead. Next stop on the tour, he made a deal with Waylon Jennings. He had the flu real bad. He asked me, would you let me have your place on the plane? I said, well, if it's all right with Buddy, it's okay with me. It's funny how you know, for two minutes in a, in a life can turn around several people's lives. Yeah, Dad was about 20 pounds lighter. He might have been able to fit on that bus somewhere and get comfortable. You know, who knows? I may never have asked. You know, there was a thing that happened that night. Buddy was leaning back against the wall and in his cane bottom chair laughing at me because he says, you're not going on the plane tonight, huh? And I said, no. He said, 
well, I hope your old bus freezes up. And I said, well, again, you know, and I said, well, I hope your old plane crashes, you know. Now, I was awful young, and it took me a long time to get over that. As Buddy, the Big Bopper, and Tommy also prepared to leave, Tommy made one last check of the dressing room and ran into Richie Valens. Richie was standing there signing autographs. For some reason, he said, you gonna let me fly? And I just flipped a 50 cent piece and said, call it, you know. You know, he called heads. And... Richie won the toss and a seat on the plane. A cold northeast wind blew as Carol Anderson drove Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, and the Big Bopper to the Mason City Airport. 21-year-old pilot Roger Peterson was waiting with the single-engine Beechcraft Bonanza. February 3rd, 1959. Just past midnight, Buddy Holly, the Big Bopper, and Richie Valens climbed aboard a single-engine four-seater Beechcraft Bonanza at Mason City Airport, Iowa. The biggest stars in rock and roll had just disappeared. In the pre-dawn hours of February 3rd, 1959, a plane carrying Buddy Holly, the Big Bopper, and Richie Valens took off into the wintry Iowa sky. The next morning, about a quarter after seven, the phone rang, and I was still home, and uh, it was Mr. Dwyer, and he says, Carol, he said, uh, our party that went out last night never got to Fargo. DJ Bob Hale was at radio station KIRV. And while I was on, a little after 9 o'clock, the bulletin bell rang on the UPI telling us that there was a wreckage found of a light aircraft outside the Mason City Clear Lake Airport. And I broke in with that bulletin. I didn't even think about the plane from the night before. Didn't even dawn on me. And I just read the bulletin and we went on with music. And about 30 seconds later, the phone rang. It was Carol Anderson, the manager of the surf ballroom. He called. He said, Bob, I've just been out to that wreckage site of that airplane you had the bulletin. I said, why were you there? He said, to identify the bodies. I said, what do you mean? And he said, Bob, Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, and JP are dead. Their plane crashed. They're dead. <laughs> trying to put together a story, a story of a happy success for three young singers that ended in a very sad death this morning early in the cornfield near Mason City and Clear Lake, Iowa. The plane went down minutes after takeoff, just five miles northwest of the airport. The official cause listed way back then by the FAA was pilot error. I, I don't believe that because this young pilot knew that airplane or Jerry Dwyer would not have put him in that airplane. I am convinced that it's that storm that caused the plane crash. They knocked the snow off the roof of a house about a mile back. And that plane just gradually went into the ground. The one wing had hit the ground and tore out a chunk of ground about four inches deep and about three foot long. And that was frozen solid, that ground. And from then on, it was just a corkscrew. I mean, it just end over end over end. And it all ended up along the line fence there. All the cables were wrapped around the tails up in the air. All three stars were thrown from the twisted wreckage. The body of pilot Roger Peterson was pinned inside the shattered plane. I seen uh, two bodies land just, oh, 12 to 15 feet from the airplane. One was Buddy Holly and one was a uh, Richie Valens, and I said to Sheriff Allen, where's the third one? He said, across the line, fa or the fence there, about 40 rows of corn in, the big bopper lays over there. This is a day that ended in tragedy for three of the biggest names in the music business. The names in order of bigness probably would be Richie Valens, Buddy Holly of the Crickets and also the Big Bopper. The Big Bopper was 28 years old. Buddy Holly, 22. Richie Valens was only 17. You're mine. I had KFWB on, and just as I passed the front of the Palladium, I'll never forget it. Is this Jackie said, and now the late, great Richie Valens. And it was just like somebody had 
hit me in the stomach with a baseball bat. I really had a tremendous physical reaction. The announcer said three top rock and roll singers have been killed, and one of them is Richie Valens. I mean, I was terrified. I screamed, and I couldn't. It's pretty hard to even talk about it. We had a, a schoolmate come and say, um, aren't, you, aren't you Richie Valens' sister? And I was like, yeah, well, he's dead. And I looked at him and I said, no way. My brother's not dead. You're just jealous. And they go, well, we heard it on the news. And um, when I got home, Mama was sitting in a chair surrounded by people, and I knew it was true. I just ran to her, and I said, not Richie. Mama, no. And I just remember, you know, falling on my knees and burying my head in her lap. I was so sure that that wasn't him on the plane. I was so sure that it was wrong, that I'd call the house or I'd go over there and everything would be fine. It would, wouldn't be him. He was on the bus, but it was wrong. In Texas, former cricket guitarist Nicky Sullivan heard the news from a fan and asked his mother to call Buddy Holly's mother to confirm it. And when Mrs. Holly answered, I remember we're close to 7, 38 o'clock in the morning. Is it true what I heard about Buddy? Mrs. Holly, Buddy's mother, said, Oh, I don't know. What? My God, she didn't know. She had no idea. My wife told me, you better get out of your work clothes and put on some clean clothes and go to your mother's house. And I said, why? She wouldn't tell me for a little while. And then she said, well, we heard over the radio that uh, Buddy was in a plane crash. And I said, is he alive? She said, I don't know. But she said, I think he said that uh, everyone was dead. And so that's the way we got the news. It was on the air before we ever were notified. The news soon reached Cricket's drummer, Jerry Allison, and his wife, Peggy Sue. Jerry was devastated, just paralyzed. It was just like turning the lights out. It, you know, it's like the sun didn't shine, and, and if it did, who cared? It just hit all. It had just stopped. Buddy's wife, Maria Elena, was grief-stricken when she learned of the crash. Within months, she would miscarry their unborn child. If you do your best. In Beaumont, Texas, J.P. Richardson's best friend had just come home after his shift at the radio station when he got the call. I was stunned. I was numb. I immediately got up and went to the radio station, and it was confirmed that the crash had occurred and that J.P. had uh, perished. And... Uh, it was the day that uh, our lives stopped. And there's someone who's watching over you tonight. Later, I did talk with his wife. It was very difficult for Titi to accept JP's death. I mean, she was very young, had a five-year-old daughter, uh, six months pregnant with me, and uh, this terrible thing took her husband away. So you could see the end of the rainbow within sight, and it was immediately grabbed away from her. Over you At approximately one o'clock in the morning on February 3rd, 1959, Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, and the Big Bopper were killed in a plane crash. Later that morning, the other members of the Winter Dance Party reached the next stop on their tour and were greeted with the grim news. The road manager and I walked in the hotel, and there was a TV in the lobby, and it was a picture of the Big Bopper on TV. I said, put me in a room next to Buddy Holly. He said, are you at that show? And I said, yeah. He said, well, then you know those guys got killed in a plane crash. I said, what? He said, just like that. He said, yeah, those guys got killed in a plane crash this morning. So, you know, just bam, we knew about it. J.P. Richardson was dead, and I was alive. And because he was dead, I was alive. 
Although the Winter Dance Party was devastated by the deaths of three of its top performers, the tour continued, and that night, Waylon Jennings had to stand in for his pal, Buddy, and sing his song. I, mean, I just wanted to go home. You know? I'd, never, I'd never faced anything like that. I'd never known anyone that close to who had died. Crying, waiting, hoping you come back. I just can't seem to get you off my mind. Teenagers across the country and around the world were stunned to learn that three of rock and roll's brightest stars had been killed in a plane crash. A lot of the kids, were, the boys particularly, were already wearing black armbands. And did you hear what happened? They wouldn't even say it out loud. They were whispering it. And it just, it hit us real hard. Very, very hard. I was standing in my living room and uh, came on the radio. The plane went down last night, taking three rock and roll players, J.P. Richardson, known as the Big Bobber, Richie Valens, and Buddy Holly. I remember my stomach dropped, and I was standing in this position, my shoulders down, and I'd like you're the radio, shoulders down like this, and I looked at it like that. I stood there for about 15, 20 minutes, didn't move. In 59, as a paper boy, uh, I went and cut open these papers one day, and there it said, Buddy Holly and the Big Bopper and Richie Valens had been killed in a plane crash. I remember it was just like somebody took in and punched me right in the face. I just couldn't believe it. It took the best people off of that tour. It took the best people. I'm talking about kind, good-hearted people that uh, you can't imagine them being bad to somebody. And it took their lives. And I never understood that. And to this day, when I think about that, it makes me a little bit mad. Given the situation in rock and roll in 1959, uh, the plane crash could have been almost a lethal blow. Elvis was in the army. Chuck Berry had a little bit of trouble with an underage girl. Jerry Lee Lewis's career was in eclipse because he had married his teenage cousin. Little Richard had decided he didn't want to play rock and roll anymore and he had joined the ministry. So, the deaths of Buddy Holly and Richie Valens and the Big Bopper was kind of an exclamation point to this whole period. That plane crash nearly helped bury rock and roll, and we were stuck for a couple of years with uh, a lot of teen idols that didn't have much backbone to their sound until the Beatles came over here and uh, saved our souls. <laughs> Pop music progressed from teen idols to the Beatles, and by the early 1970s, Holly, Valens, and the Bopper's music had been stashed away like forgotten oldies. Then Don McLean wrote about the day the music died. I started singing bye bye, Miss American Pie. American Pie speaks to the loss that we feel. That's why that song has is, is, is found the niche that it has. I'm singing, this will be the day that I die. A decade after the deaths of Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, and the Big Bopper, memories of the tragedy inspired the song that would become a pop anthem. When 1970 came around, and I was now beginning to make records, I suddenly began to write about Buddy Holly and remembering what happened. And started out with, you know, a long, long time ago. Long, long time ago. I can still remember how that music used to make me smile. Shortly after Buddy died, like the next year, my father died. And I had been still trying to come to terms with my father's death and with Buddy Holly's death and with all these things that had happened. And so I put this in the song. Bad news on the doorstep. I couldn't take one more step. I can't remember if I cried when I read about his widowed bride. But something touched me deep inside the day the music died. So bye-bye, Miss American Pie. I only dedicated the album to Buddy. I never said it was about him, but radio people sensed right away that there was this connection with the day the music died and the dedication on the album. 
They would play American Pie, they played That'll Be the Day. And I remember hearing that on the radio and thinking, well, this is great. This is amazing. You know, what, what music can do. You know, I'm bringing Buddy back to everybody. American Pie struck a chord, and in January 1972, 13 years after the tragic crash, it was the number one record in the country. I was on a boat, and I heard that song once, down in Fort Lauderdale, and I started crying. That's how much the song means to me. Not only to me, it means a lot to others as well. And McLean, with one really deft brush stroke, brought it all back home to me, and, uh, help put those performers back on the map. While Don McLean's anthem, American Pie, reminded rock and roll fans about the day the music died, it was a movie that brought Buddy Holly back to life. All of my love, all of my kissing, you don't know what you've been a missing, oh boy. I discovered Buddy when I was in the sixth grade. Holly's music was such a force in my life because it lifted me, it made me feel good, it made me feel strong. All of my life I've been awake, tonight there'll be no hesitation, oh boy. Gary Busey had idolized Buddy Holly for more than 20 years. In 1978, he got the chance to play his hero in the Buddy Holly story. Busey's transformation into Buddy Holly earned him an Academy Award nomination. And I had these glasses to look through with my hair all curled up and per permanent. And there was no more Gary Busey. I couldn't find Gary Busey in the movie. So I will tell you this, that playing Buddy Holly was the first experience I had making film. In fact, it's the only experience I've had making film where the spirit was with me and wrapped itself around me. Just to know why. Gary Busey wasn't the only one moved by Holly's spirit. For Buddy's widow, Maria Elena, the film stirred deep emotions. I met Maria Elena when the movie premiered, and, and she started weeping and left during the song, Just You Know Why. True Love Way. I thought, boy, we really messed up, but no, Buddy was in the room with her. You know why, just you and I know true love way. A decade later, in 1987, La Bamba resurrected the memory of Richie Valens. As he researched and acted the leading role, Lou Diamond Phillips connected emotionally with Richie's family. For me and for the family, and in a very weird way, in a very sort of existential way, it was Richie all over again. Richie was there. I know I put Lou through some stuff. I mean, he, he did become Richie to me for those three months. The only time it ever became a, a real issue and, and, and it became a, a difficulty um, was the night that we shot the scene where Marshall Crenshaw and playing Buddy Holly and myself uh, and Stephen Lee as the big bobber get into the plane to take off, to fly away. It was Connie. She came to the set, which might not have been such a good idea for her. Hey, Richie, relax, man. Everything's cool. Besides, the sky belongs to the stars, right? She just starts trembling and she says to me, why did you go? Why did you have to go? Richie, why did you have to go? And she throws herself on, you know, onto me and she's crying and, and, uh, and I'm holding her and she's just sobbing over and over. Why did you have to go? Why did you have to go? You know, it was, ah, uh, I was lost at that time. You know, I, I, I had no, no idea what to do. There was so much pain still that we had never been able to just let out. We had never really been able to grieve because everybody used to tell us, be quiet, don't cry. And with La Bamba, all of us were able to finally, I guess, accept, let go. If you do your best. While the making of La Bamba was a healing experience for Richie Valens' family, for the big bopper's son, born three months after his father's death, finding closure has been more difficult. I wasn't raised knowing that my father was somebody special. I just know that 
when I got into my teenage years, I won't I ask questions. And I wasn't given answers. The Big Bopper's son also asked Bob Hale about his dad's last hours at the surf ballroom. At that particular time, Buddy's wife was expecting, the Bopper's wife was expecting, and my wife was expecting. And while we were sitting there, J.P. Richardson said to my wife, Kathy, may I put my hand on your tummy? And she said, sure. She said, this is what I miss most about being on the road, feeling my baby move in my wife's tummy. And when I told this story to J.P.'s son a few years ago, I mean, he just, the tears just flowed because he said, Bobby, I'm trying to find out who my daddy is. And um, he said, um, now I know my daddy loved me before I was born. That's what I remember most uh, about that. Chantilly lace and a pretty face and a pony. You know, Dad's, you know, he's more than a footnote to Buddy Holly's death and Richie Ballin's death. Uh, Chantilly lace was released in uh, August of 58. Dad was killed less than six months later. And the song lives today uh, and does it live. Oh, baby, that's what I like! <laughs> Today, J.P. carries on his father's rock and roll legacy with his own band. Some kids, their mother or father pass on, leave them a hardware store, you know, real estate, big fat chunk of change. Uh, my dad left me his name and maybe a little bit of his voice. <laughs> Wide lightning. Four decades after the crash, the music of three of rock and roll's early pioneers lives on. A lemon and honey, this is the Big Bopper knocking. The Big Bopper's music is heard in any rock band that wants to get a little goofy now and then. He was the clown prince of his day. <laughs> Richie Valens can be heard in the music of Los Lobos, in the music of every rock and roll band that features a Latino performer. Oh, hell, the little things you say and do make me want to be with you. Buddy Holly's everywhere. He's everywhere. Anytime some kid plugs a Fender guitar into an amp, He's there. Well, all right, so I'm being foolish. Well, all right, let people know about the dreams and wishes you wish in the night when lights are low. Well, all right, well, all right, oh, we will live and love with all our might. Well, all right, well, all right, our lifetime love will be all right. Well, all right, so I'm going steady. It's all right when people say that those foolish kids can't be ready for the love 